Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar this morning. I trust that no one had any problems logging in. This is Karen Firehawk speaking, and I'm going to be just setting us up and monitoring the chat room during our webinar. Karen, can you uh, see the Yes, it looks great. It okay. looks great, and it's 9.59 a.m., so we can start in one minute. Okay, just let me know when you want me to start. Absolutely. Uh, and for everyone who's attending, we are recording this webinar, so it will be available for you afterwards if there is something that you want to capture. We will also send out a copy of the slides to everyone who's attending today, as well as a recording that you can share with your colleagues. I will also be monitoring the chat as well as the question panel. And then we will have a time at the end for you to ask your questions live if you don't want to type your question out. I will answer them aloud so that everyone can hear because a lot of times you all have the same questions. So with that, Francis Waite, we are ready for you to begin. I will mute myself now. Okay, thanks. Um, welcome everybody to our grant webinar. Um, I want to kind of go over go over the grant. It's very similar to last year. So, um, so I'm from the Forestry Commission, and we've got Karen Firehawk on from the Green Infrastructure Center, and um, MJ White is a grant consultant that the Forestry Commission works with, and she should be coming on soon. Um, all attendees will be muted, and so if you have a question, please use the chat feature, and Karen can respond in real time or at the end, and we're going to share this recording with everyone um, at the end, and we'll also have this uh, as a recording on our website so people can watch it later, too. Um, so the Forestry Commission is, um, our mission is to protect, promote, enhance, and nurture the forest lands of South Carolina in a manner consistent with achieving the greatest good for citizens. And responsibilities extend to all forest lands, rural and urban. And um, it's not limited to timber, but we include wildlife, water quality, air quality, soil protection, recreation, and aesthetics. And we're divided into three regions, the PD, the Piedmont, and the coastal. And um, the forestry, um, our, our forest management chief is Russell Hubright, and he's in the Columbia office. And I am Francis Waite. I'm the Urban Forestry Coordinator. I have statewide responsibilities and I do provide direct assistance to Richland and Lexington counties. And here's my contact information if you need me. And we have Dina Whitesides in the Piedmont region and, and she serves the counties of Abbeville, Anderson, Cherokee, Chester, Edgefield, Fairfield, Greenville, Greenwood, Lawrence, McCormick, Newberry, Oconee, Pickens, Saluda, Spartanburg Union, and York counties, and that is her um, contact information. We have Lois Edwards. She's a PD region urban forester, Chesterfield, Clarendon, Darlington, Dillon, Florence, Georgetown, Ori, Kershaw, Lancaster, Lee, Marion, Marlboro, Sumter, and Williamsburg counties are the counties that she serves, and here's her contact information, telephone and email. And we have Kara Specht. She serves the coastal region, which are the counties of Aiken, Allendale, Bamberg, Barnwell, Beaufort, Berkeley, Calhoun, Charleston, Colleton, Dorchester, Hampton, Jasper, and Orangeburg. And that's her phone number and email if you need her. And so um, the, the, the Forestry Commission has the Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is where we work under, and we provide financial assistance for urban and community forestry projects to local governments. And so this particular grant is for municipalities and counties and the program authority comes from the federal government and so that means that we're a federally federally funded program and all statutes and applicable federal administrative requirements apply to our grant subrecipients so this grant is a two-part process just like it was last year 
Um, first of all, you, to be eligible, you need to complete the self-assessment tool through an online survey. Last year, we had a PDF, so this should make it a little bit easier. And the survey tool lets us know the status of your program and helps us um, to know what your locality may need. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to complete. If you need a hard copy um, and you can't do it online, please let me know, send me an email, and I'll make sure that you um, get a PDF or something that you can fill out. Um, staff is going to review your responses and consult you for additional um, information if needed. And then your agency would be offered technical assistance through the Forestry Commission and the Green Infrastructure Center at no cost to you and your community. And then uh, second part of this is um, you can apply for, if you have an invitation, you can apply for funding directly from the Forestry Commission after reviewing your self-assessment tool. You might be invited to um, apply for a cooperative subaward agreement, and this determination will be made after we review um, the self-assessment tool and after talking with um, a representative from your agency. And for example, you might need a new canopy map and you want to work on a management plan, so you might do something around at the same time or just, um, you know, only work with GIC. But if you already have um, some information, um, you might be able just to go ahead to do like an urban forest management plan without working with Green Infrastructure Center. So the options for funding are working directly with the Green Infrastructure Center for technical assistance at no cost to the community. And that would be a cooperative agreement between the Forestry Commission and Green Infrastructure Center. And then the second one would be Green Infrastructure Center assistance plus direct, direct um, financial support from the Forestry Commission. And that would be through a cost reimbursement cooperative agreement. And then the third is just you would have an agreement only with the Forestry Commission based on um, prior assessments and previous technical assistance. So before you take the survey, there's five things that you might want to have on hand. Um, does your locality have a digital tree canopy cover map and data? If so, what year was it created? Does your city have a tree inventory? When was it collected and for which areas? Does your city have an urban forest management plan or a forest master plan and how old is it? Um, does your city use it? Does your city have a storm mitigation plan and how old is the plan and what year was it created? Does your city employ an arborist? If that's okay, that's not an expectation, but um, it's some information that we'd wanna know. And what is the racial and ethnic makeup of the people who would be served by the project with the locality? And if the project serves the entire city, you can use a census report for your area. And so we have some information on how to look up the census block groups and get the results for your area. And so if, if your answer is no to one to five, that's okay. We would definitely want to begin with a technical assistance grant from the Green Infrastructure Center um, helping to provide some canopy information for you. And so the survey should be about 15 minutes to fill out. We have the link right here. Um, it's also on our website. And then the person filling it out should be authorized um, to fill it out for the community. And so at the end of it, we're going to um, work with you to determine what would be the best project, which you kind of need most right at, um, at the time that you turn that survey tool in. And so now we're going to have um, Karen Firehawk talk. She's going to talk a little bit about what the Green Infrastructure is, Center is and um, about you know, some of the projects that we've done and that we could do with you. Thank you, Francis. And um, with that, I'll just talk a few moments about our work. So we have been working in the state of South Carolina for about the past 10 years. And in fact, um, the rest of my team is actually physically in South Carolina right now, uh, working with some councils of government on a statewide plan for green infrastructure. Uh, but we are the technical service provider for this grant. And what that means is that <clears throat> your community makes a request, say, for help with the tree canopy map or documenting the environmental services provided by our trees for reducing urban heating or cleaning the air. And then we do all that technical work with you. And then we pro provide the results to the state and back to your community. So uh, if you just want technical support, then no money changes hands. It's a pretty straightforward relationship where we do the work in cooperation with you. Um, so Francis, if you can go to the next slide.
Francis, if you can click to the next slide, it might be a little bit of a delay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, many, many communities need help with tree canopy mapping, planning, or management. Uh, and so uh, we're providing technical support. And as Francis said, we do really need you to complete the self-assessment tool online. Once you pre-gathered some of the information, such as are you a tree city USA or, you know, have you mapped your canopy and how long ago was it? Um, it takes you to the end and asks you a series of questions so that you can figure out the support that you most need. So <clears throat> it could be a case where you check that you want help with everything and we might come back and say, well, first you need to take, take care of these first two or three steps. So we'll take a look at what you uh, put into the form and it is a competitive grant. So uh, last year I can report that 14 communities applied and we were able to help all 14 communities. And then several additional communities uh, got direct grant support from the state. So, uh, so far uh, we have been able to accommodate everyone who's requested, but just to let you know it's competitive. So put your best foot forward. And there's a box on the survey that asks you to tell us the reason why now is a particularly strategic time for you to apply for this funding. So let's say your comprehensive plan is coming up soon and you hope to pull in some new data about your urban forest to inform your comp plan. That's the kind of information we're looking for. Uh, you know, how will you use the results? Why is it important to your community? All right, next slide. Okay, so there's a variety of different types of technical support that are offered through this funding. The first is canopy mapping, and I'll show you an example of that. But it's not just a map of your canopy. It also shows you where you can plant future trees, so how you might grow your canopy larger or at least replant to keep up with tree loss from development. And it even gets down to the level of individual trees, large and small canopy trees, so we can tell you exactly how many trees you can fit into the landscape and work with you on setting a goal for what you'd like to achieve. Ecosystem benefits modeling, there's a, that's a second level of support. So uh, once you know your canopy, there's a lot of different models and tools we can apply to, for example, know how, how well your trees are cleaning the air of particulate matter or vault organic compounds. Uh, we can look at how much carbon they're storing and sequestering. We can look at shade and heat benefits. Uh, so for example, how can trees make your city cooler? Uh, or stormwater uptake. We have a model that calculates how much stormwater the trees soak up and how much more stormwater you could soak up if you plant more trees. We also can help you with messaging the benefits, like translating sort of uh, technical or dry scientific information into punchy messages that people will understand. Tree inventories is another level of work. That's a field-based assessment of tree location, size, species, condition, and needs. And that can also uh, help you with planning for, let's say you have too much of one particular type of tree species, um, or you find that you have a lot of ash trees in your downtown when you really shouldn't because of emerald ash borer and other pests. So it helps you figure out where your trees are, their condition. You might have trees that are damaged from a recent storm that you need to replace. So it really helps you create a strategic plan for managing your canopy. Tree planting plans and urban forest master plans this is where you get into your specific strategies. Uh, so we you would need to have already had a recent tree canopy map and plantable area map. So for those of you who may have had, say, canopy mapping in round one, you might decide that you want to have a strategic plan for your urban forest in round two. Um, so we do need data to create this, um, but it also helps you with tracking trees planted and budgeting so that you can come up with the numbers that you need uh, to better manage your programs or to solicit funding. Urban forest management plans, that is a detailed plan for how to care for urban forests. It usually gets into the level of detail of staffing, equipment, you know, do you need to buy a new bucket truck, for example? Uh, what's the care required to manage your urban forest, et cetera. So there's a lot of work and that's more like almost a business plan, if you will, but it can help inform your capital improvement plan or your budgeting request uh, through your agencies. Emergency forest and storm planning. Uh, we're all very aware of the threats of storms to our uh, urban forests. And so there are a lot of steps you could take to better prepare. 
uh, such as pre-contracting. So for example, uh, if you already have contracts in place for debris removal, and these are by FEMA certified contractors so they get reimbursed, you'll be in a much better position for the next storm. So this helps you figure out uh, all of the different uh, steps you need to take to prepare for reco and recover from any kind of storm event or other, other events that uh, might cause hazards. Tree risk assessment, uh, that's specifically using folks who are certified in tree risk assessment. Our company is certified in both um, in that as well as tree uh, inventory. But for both tree risk assessment and inventory, it's our recommendation that you hire someone local who knows your particular forest the best. So in that case, it would be a direct financial grant from the South Carolina Forestry Commission to your community so that you could hire local consultants to do this work. Um, but that can help you make sure that you rid your community of trees that might be risky. And I don't wanna to get too much into the details, but just to say that there could be an old decaying tree, but it's not a risk because it's in the middle of the woods, far away from any public pathways, versus say a tree that was overhanging the entry to city hall, the courthouse, or a school where it's it looks risky, it might fall, we need to evaluate it and, and take it down or harvest those uh, problem limbs before we get too much further. And then finally, um, a green infrastructure plan. This is what I sort of call putting it all together. If you would actually like to create a strategic plan for how you create connected green pathways across your entire community, that could include greenway planning. It can look at your largest chunks of intact habitat and how to protect those. But it's a strategic plan for the entire city. Um, so for those of you who want to go big, uh, that could be an option if you've already done most of these other things in the list. Um, so these are the, the types of support, and they're explained uh, with more detail in the actual online survey. But once you go through the survey and answer a series of questions, if that brings you to this list and you can check boxes for the ones that you think are most appropriate for your community. And like I said, it's probably unlikely that you should check every box. You can't do all of this simultaneously. So just uh, hopefully the survey as you complete it helps you, helps you answer a bunch of questions and tells you what you should be doing. All right, so the technical support, here's an example of a tree canopy map. Um, so on the left, you might see, um, I think, believe this is part of, um, yeah, Charleston, this is inner West Ashley, one corner of the city. And in the green shows you all the existing canopy and on the right in the orange shows you all of the areas that were identified that could be planted. Next slide. So as she's clicking, so once you have that canopy data, you can actually figure out how much uh, pollutants the trees are taking up as well as how much more pollution you could take up, like I said, or stormwater or reducing urban heating. All right, urban forest management plans. So uh, as we said, there are a lot of different steps from visioning to mapping the inventory to creating strategies, a monitoring plan and how you're going to adapt over time. So that's one option. Next one. Tree risk assessment. So <laughs> even uh, though Francis is certified, I would say that we can all agree this tree is probably in bad shape. Uh, but there is a, a whole protocol that needs to be gone through. So if you decide you would like to conduct a tree risk assessment, uh, make sure that you will be hiring someone who's certified in doing this work. Um, but we can also help you in your strategic plan with figuring out what areas should be assessed. You'll never be able to afford to assess the risk to every tree in your community. So it's good to have a strategic reason, you know, which blocks you want to survey the risk for, which locations and why. Next slide. Tree inventory, uh, understand your trees can help you make sure that you do tree better management. I already mentioned a situation where you might have trees that are inappropriate because they're under attack by a certain pest that's likely to die. But you can also- Something happened to your sound, Karen. Commit, did you, something gonna come unplugged? Hear me now? It's just softer, but- Can you hear me now? Go ahead. It's, it's softer, but maybe people cut their volume up. No, I think it's a problem interior to my computer. I'm going to buy a new computer. I sold you things. This webinar. So, 
Um, I was just mentioning that a tree inventory can tell you uh, the types of trees you have present, whether there's inappropriate species, such as I mentioned, uh, emerald ash borer, attacking ash trees, but you might also find that you have too many of the same type of tree. For example, one community we worked with, they found that 50% of their trees were crepe myrtle, and that's not a good tree diversity for a downtown. So uh, you can use this data in many different ways, uh, and we can help you figure that out. But this is something you would also out hire out a local consultant for. Next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. There's a little delay here. Uh, then, um, you know, as I said, is your community ready for a storm? Do you have plans for not only uh, cleaning up debris, but where are you taking your, your tree debris? Uh, are you putting it in a landfill? Um, there are other programs that you can envision, such as uh, programs where uh, they actually have uh, carpenters who are sort of standing by who can take uh, down trees and cure the wood. So there are a lot of different ways that we can better manage our trees, but we need to have all of this in place. Contracts for cleanup, clear procedures for storm recovery, how you get reimbursed for trees. Like I said, where do you take those down trees? And then uh, you could use our free technical support to create data for your plan and hire a, a consultant to develop a mitigation plan if needed. Next slide. All right, and you can also use this data for many different social needs as well. So this is an example of looking at urban heat islands, which means you know when we have paved areas that get excessively hot and create sort of a bubble of heat around our cities. So here's an example of Greenville, South Carolina, where we did some work. And you see on the left-hand side of your screen, the hottest areas in the city, um, as well as the census block group by census block groups. And then if you look on the right-hand image, you see uh, census block groups and percent of tree canopy. So we can see that a lot of the areas that are the hottest also have the lowest amount of tree canopy, and they also are shown to have some of the lower income folks in the community. So we can use this data to help us in prioritizing where we should plant first in the places, for example, where people are least likely to be able to afford trees and need help with planting, and also the areas where people are suffering the most because of excessive urban heating. So there's a lot that you can do with this data to help protect public health, as well as make your community more equitable. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just pulling in some of those bubbles. Keep clicking, Francis. I just highlighted where some of those areas were. Okay, next. All right, so as we said, you can also create an urban forest master plan. Um, this, this map here on the left is showing how we took the open space areas of Greenville and we, in pink, are all the small trees that could be fitted and in dark green dots are all the large trees that could be fitted. So you can get very specific data from this work. For example, uh, we figured out that Greenville could plant a total of 105,468 trees. They could plant 40 foot diameter trees um, 43,736 and small trees 61,732. And indeed, as part of the project, Greenville and uh, Trees Upstate have embarked on a tree planting campaign, Plant GBL, and they're actively planting tens of thousands of trees. So this data can be really helpful for budgeting and knowing exactly where you can make a difference in your city. Next slide. All right, so these are uh, just these little stars are showing you where we did projects in 2021. We asked people from throughout the state to apply. And as I said, last year, we were fortunate in that we were able to help all the communities. I believe the total number was about 18. Uh, so we're really looking forward uh, to those of you who may have had grants in the past, perhaps going to the next level up. Uh, perhaps you did a canopy map and now you're ready for ecosystem services analysis. So we already have a couple applications in. The survey is open now. Um, and then for those of you who are new, 
uh, taking our self-assessment tool survey and figuring out what you most need help with right now. All right, next slide. Okay, so some quick highlights. Uh, we did create canopy maps, canopy goals for communities that didn't even have a goal in the past. They created strategies for 13 communities across the state. We've held 39 workshops uh, to review data, discuss challenges with each community and identify community-led initiatives and solutions. So our team is very experienced in, in helping communities create tree planting campaigns. So we'll not only help you with your data, but we'll also help you with strategizing what to do next and how to pay for it. Uh, there were 13 urban tree canopy assessments and many reports are created are in progress. So all those reports actually are pretty much done now. And two communities are also developing urban forest management plans. So they have uh, hired private consultants using the funding available from the South Carolina Forestry Commission. Next slide. All right, so here's an example um, from uh, Conway, South Carolina and North Augusta. So it's just how, just an example of how the canopy map comes out. And then here's North Augusta with their map of potential planting areas. So uh, we will workshop with you. We meet with you uh, multiple times throughout the project. Most of the meetings are online and we workshop you through making sure that the data is correct and then helping you set your goals and develop your strategy. Next. Okay, and then you can take this data once you have your canopy map, you can do a lot of other analyses with it. So you can pick up to four geographies of analysis. So in Goose Creek, for example, they wanted to know how hot are their streets. That's really important to look at canopy shading if you want people to walk to school. A lot of communities are having trouble with uh, bus drivers. So a lot of communities are switching to kids walking to school where they can. Uh, this can help you make sure that they have a safe and shaded route. Or if you want people to uh, frequent your downtown business district to make sure that it's not too hot, that you have adequate shade and it's inviting. A little cute stat is people shop longer and pay more per item in tree line shopping districts. Uh, or you can look at it by parcel. So you can look at every parcel in the city and see how well treated they are. And then you could uh, work strategically with different landowners to help them with planting strategies. Next slide. And then here's an example of uh, urban heating. Uh, Rock Hill was really interested in just how hot Rock Hill is getting. Um, so uh, you see degrees Fahrenheit in the bar chart at the right. So the red is 92 degrees to 112 degrees. Orange is 90 to 92. And the sort of lighter orange is 88 to 90 degrees. So you can, at a glance, see where your hottest parts of the city are, but you can also, as I said, bring in the census data to look at median household income, which is the purple line, and also look at heat. So you can see that relationship uh, that, you know, the, the higher income you have, the less hot it is. Uh, and we can look at uh, where we can plant trees to make a difference for that. And also the city does plan to prioritize their outreach and engagement into these underserved neighborhoods as a result of this data. So even if you feel that this is already the case in your community, having data can be a really great tool to convince the local government that they need to take action. In one community that we worked with in the past, we had to present the data three times till they finally believed us, but they then did change their planting strategy to help those at greatest need. Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the grant aspect of it. So um, the key items to consider about that um, after you've completed the self-assessment tool and the consultation process, you may be invited to fit, submit a full application for project funding and your agency would need to consider the following when planning your project, matching funds, indirect costs, and ineligible costs. So the, the match would be for 20%. So if the project total would be 20,000, Forestry Commission would provide 16,000 of federal funding and the community must provide 4,000. 
and match may be in the form of cash, such as staff time, or in-kind contributions from a third party, donation of goods and services. All contributions must come from non-federal sources. Matching funds for this project may not be used matched for any other federal cost share project. And all matching funds must be specifically related to the proposed project. And documentation of all matching support must be maintained and submitted with the reimbursement. Um, indirect costs are eligible for reimbursement under the program. Um, that rate can be negotiated and approved by the sub-recipient's cognizant federal agency for indirect costs. That for us is the Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service. If your community does not have a federal indirect cost rate, the Forestry Commission can negotiate an indirect cost rate with your agency that complies with the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, you may elect to use a 10% de minimis indirect cost rate, which is um, kind of easier to do if your agency is eligible. So there are certain things that would be ineligible for um, cost reimbursement, expenses incurred before or after the agreement period, any expenses not approved, food, drink, or refreshments, costs associated with preparing the application, salaries of current staff, um, we would have to you know, evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, general overhead and administration, expenses not supported by proper documentation, um, shrub flowers or ground covers may qualify as match if um, prior approval, and um, costs associated with regular uh, tree maintenance wouldn't be, and purchase of construction and landscape supplies or equipment, and um, purchase of equipment would not be eligible. So the timeline, um, I'm just going to give you a general one. Um, so definitely on December the 9th, um, the self-assessment tool is due. So you want to do that by 5 p.m. And if you cannot um, do it online, please let me know. I can, I can work with you. There's my email there. Um, the full application request um, would be between December 22nd through mm -hmm. January 23rd. Um, following the outcome of the review of the self-assessment tool. Um, the cooperative agreements would be issued after that time, maybe sometime in the spring. Um, and so projects can begin maybe uh, in February or March 2023, so that's approximate. And you'd be given a year to do the project. And um, so you'd if you had to have an extension or anything, you, you couldn't do it after the project unless you had permission with an extension. And we encourage all the communities that are not Tree City USA to become one. And if you're not and you're interested, you can definitely talk with me, Dina Whitesides, Lois Edwards, or Kara Specht, um, your urban foresters for your area about how to, how to do that. Um, so hundreds of towns across America are, are Tree City USA. We have about 43 in South Carolina. Communities of any population can qualify. They just need to be in municipality. Um, Tree City USA recognition contributes to community pride and serves as a blueprint for planning and maintaining your community's trees and connects Tree City USA communities and um, gives you information about other resources out there to help grow your program. You, the Arbor Day Foundation provides a, a plaque, a Tree City USA flag, and, and highway signs for community entrance, entrances to each Tree City USA. So the standards, you have to do four things to qualify, and um, tree board or department. The second is having a, a tree care ordinance for public trees. You have to spend at least $2 per capita with your budget um, on urban and community forestry program and you have to observe Arbor Day and have a proclamation. And so, you know, just let us know if you have um, further information about that. We'll be glad to help you um, apply for that. We have a um, Planners Force Toolkit, and we have the um, that online. So if you, if you want to just um, get it as a PDF, we also have some copies of it, and if you want a copy of it, just, just let me know. We can make sure that your community gets a, a hard copy of it as well. It provides a lot of information about, you know, what should be in management plans. It gives a lot of information about ordinances and some ordinances around South Carolina. 
and you know kind of looking at how they're written and you might want to adopt something similar or use you know parts of it so we're that's kind of a, a good resource for communities to use so this grants you know just think about you know do you want your community to be more shaded and cooler you want to be better prepared for storms how can you plant trees more strategically um, how can you create realistic goals and budgets and how can you become more resilient to climate change and create a more equitable and healthy communities. And um, here we have the link to our survey monkey if you um, would like to fill out that self-assessment and begin that process for the grant program. This is my um, contact information. Um, so if you if you need to you know get in touch with me, that's how you do it. And do we have any questions? And um, before we go into questions, I was wondering if Karen could put the links in the chat. I was just going to let people know of two webinars we have coming up and talk about the Trees SC annual conference. So tomorrow at 11 a.m. we have a webinar on invasive urban pests in South Carolina designed with planning commissioners and planners in mind with Dr. David Coyle of Clemson Extension and there are going to be planning credits offered. On December 8th at 11 a.m. we have a webinar on root and heart rots of pines which we technically oriented, um, you know, mainly for urban foresters, people on tree boards, and um, people that would conduct tree checks for their job might be interested in this. We have SAF, um, CFE credits applied for, and Jimmy Walters is our speaker on this topic. Um, Trees SC has an annual conference mm -hmm. coming up in October that is great for professionals and tree advocates of all levels and experience. Sign up now for the conference in Greenville it's October 27th and 28th. And so now, Karen, do we have any, any questions? We had several questions that I answered uh, during the webinar, and I posted them so that everyone can see the answers. Oh, great. Uh, most, of, great. most of the questions centered around, um, you know, can we get a copy of the slide deck or can we get a copy of this webinar? So everyone will be sent a link to a recording of this webinar, and you'll also get a PDF of the entire slide deck. So you can just download that to your computer. Um, another question was, can we change the geography of analysis? One person wanted to know if they could look at their canopy saved by watershed. And I said, yes, they can. We still need to have the applicant be a local government. And let's say the watershed crossed a couple of government boundaries. I think we'd just like to know, let's say that it, there's a river that's watershed went across two towns. You wanted to map the entire watershed. It'd be great to know that the, both towns were interested in having the data. And one of the applicants would at least have to be a local government. So for example, if you're a watershed advocacy group, you want to partner with your local government and have them apply. We also can answer uh, questions live if people want to ask a question uh, so I'm going to recognize a couple of people who've got their hands raised in the chat. And I'm, start, I'm going to start with Kristen Dow. And Kristen, I'm going to unmute you now so you can ask your question aloud. Oh, you are self-muted, so. I had a question about the how the canopy mapping was done. Sure. Is that a... Is that a um, satellite-based machine yes. learning process? Yes, with one caveat. So we do use satellite imagery that's flown every two years for the United States. So we take the most recent satellite imagery, but then we also bring in that human component. So um, we also QA, QC the data to make sure that it's accurate. It's not so simple as just pushing a button. Uh, we also use LIDAR when it's available so that we want to make sure we don't confuse a bush with a tree. So LIDAR is data that, and this, I'm sure you know, this is just for everyone's benefit. Uh, it sends a beam down to earth and it measures the return interval. So if the beam comes back faster, that means the vegetation was lower to the ground. And that helps us know that it was a shrub uh, versus something that has a shorter return interval and comes back faster when it hits interference and that lets us know it's a tree. So we do that level of analysis. And then we also, when we're doing the plantable areas, we hand take out things such as 
baseball diamonds, you know, community gardens, those type of places that we know we're not going to plant trees. So we try to make sure that your data is pretty realistic. Thank you. Okay, sure. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. No. Uh, it, <laughs> all right. Let me. I'm just scanning to see if there's any other hands raised. I believe I've answered all of the questions in the chat, but I will definitely double check that. All right. So let me go to a couple of questions that are here. Ah, oh, we have. Uh, Bernil Phillips also has a hand raised. So, uh, Bernil, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Hello, uh, this is Bernil Phillips from the College of Charleston. I was curious if this revolved around uh, a campus too. We are a Tree USA campus, but I didn't. You guys have been talking about city and town, so I didn't know if that revolved around us or not to, for the grant. Go ahead, Francis. Um, yeah. So. Um, our priority is cities and counties, and um, but if if we have the resources, if, if you know, we will definitely you know work with the campus. Um, in the first round, we did work with um, USC and Columbia, and so yes, so you you would have an opportunity to um, receive this assistance. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm scanning for other hands raised very quickly. Let's see. Uh, Patricia DeHaunt, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce anyone's name, asked are county government are county government agencies eligible for technical assistance or just municipalities? Counties Francis. counties um, are eligible. Okay. Let me go to the next one. Um, Sandra Bundy asked, does a community need to employ an arborist to qualify for assistance? You, you don't need to do that. Um, so depending on, on what level of assistance, you know, you might have just Green Infrastructure Center giving you that information and in your staff that you have on hand is going to help. Um, you know, kind of whoever is available, you're going to help review to ground truths to find, you know, strategies. And so there would definitely be someone on staff working. Um, if you enter into agreement directly with us, you'd have like some information um, about your canopy or some data, then you would hire a consultant to help you. So you wouldn't necessarily need an arborist, you know. I can report though that in uh, our work across the South, some communities having done this project with us have then said, you know what, we really need to hire an arborist. So um, they've used the information to convince their municipality or their county that that's a really good position to have on hand. So as Francis White said, it's not required, but this can provide a compelling argument for why your urban forest needs management. And a, and a way to look at it is we're trying to help you grow your urban and community forestry program. So if you don't have an arborist, that should be something that you could be working towards. Okay. And then I, I answered this question not very well. So I want to bring it back up for you, Francis. Um, one person asked, what is urban? What is the criteria for urban? So they, I don't know if the person who was asking is uh, coming from a more rural community, but could you address that? Like if, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're worried they're yeah. not a town or they're not urban enough for your program. Yeah. Well, you know, we just, it's something that we call it as urban and community forestry program. And you, you think of it as, um, I guess, you know, maybe where you've got the, the cities, um, they, you know, you can kind of have a continuum that is that is in your city. You might have a, a rural forest in there. Um, you know, you might have an urban forest. I mean, I guess it's it's really kind of a broad term because it would just be the forest within a city. And um, some of those might be just forests along a sidewalk or in a park, um, but it could include, um, a, a, a rural forest um, if it was you know in the city limits or, or whatever so I would say that when you you know you're mapping a canopy map you're mapping all the trees 
that that would be inside of, of, of the city. So it can include a lot of different types of um, forests in, a, in an urban forest. So if you are in a rural community and you don't think of yourself as urban, you would still be, you know, eligible for um, assistance. So, you know, don't think of it as some kind of a disqualifier, you know, if you weren't urban enough or something. Yes, and, and we mapped all of Charleston County, for example. Um, and as you all know, they have some very urban parts and then they have some very rural parts. So sometimes what we do in that case, because it's a very large area, sometimes what we'll do is we will map the more rural forest at a, a sort of coarser resolution. So at 30 meter scale, where we look at every 30 meter square and then switch to a one meter scale of analysis when we get to the urban part. And the reason for that is that the forest doesn't necessarily change that much um, from one meter to the next in a rural area, but in a city, as you all know, like if you step six feet to the left, you might be in a very different setting. Uh, so it matters a lot more the more urban you are, how precise you are. So there's a lot of ways that we can look at that. So I would just say if you're a local government to just apply and tell us what you want to map and measure and why, and then uh, we'll work with you to figure out the best solution. So I'm scanning to see any hands up. So far, I don't see any newly raised hands. And I believe that we have answered. Oh, nope, we've got a few more. Um, we will post links to the upcoming webinars when we send out the email response. Um, I, but I do believe that we have answered all of the questions. Let me just double check. Yep. All right. So we'll give you guys one more minute to post that last question. And if not, we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. We know all of you are busy people. So just to reiterate, uh, the next step is to fill out the survey so that you can actually uh, participate. So we will send you that survey link again immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar. And we'll also send you a copy of the slide deck from today. And a little later today, there will be the recording if you actually want to listen to everything again. Um, but you'll have all the information. And then if somebody missed this webinar, like we said, you can send them the slide deck. You can send them the link to the survey. It is not required that you listen to the webinar ahead of applying for the survey. It is recommended, but not required. Uh, and you'll have all the information that you need. Um, and we did also note that if you need a paper copy of the survey, we can also provide that as a PDF or literally a paper copy. That would be a case where let's say uh, either you had a disability that made you unable to click the survey online, or perhaps you are in uh, like a lot of local governments where you have chains of command and you have to fill it out, and then show it to your boss to make sure it's okay to submit. And in that case, you probably need a printout or a paper survey. So whatever your reasons are, uh, Francis Waite will be happy to accommodate you. And um, I'll be monitoring the surveys as they come in. Francis, do you want to restate the deadline for the survey just real quick so everyone knows what their time limit oh, is? December 9th um, by 5 p.m. Okay. So that's when the iron curtain will drop. So <laughs> make sure that you have those surveys in. It only takes 15 or 20 minutes to complete, but as we said, there's a few things to collect ahead of time uh, so that you can get through it in the 15 or 20 minutes. But we thank you all for your great attention and I'll leave it to the South Carolina Forestry Commission for any final words before we close. Just thank you so much for participating and um, you know we will have this recorded. So if you wanna show it to anybody else, um, that would be great. And um, just let me know if you have any questions and we really appreciate your interest. Okay, thanks and I wish all of you a great day. Bye-bye.